Coming up on This Week in Linux, we saw some new releases from Solus, Krita, Ardor, Farin OS, and more. Debian and Gnome both celebrated their birthdays this week. We check out some cool software that lets you do Google searches from the command line. And we'll take a look at this week's gaming news. All that and more on today's episode of This Week in Linux. I'm Michael Tanell of Tux Digital with your weekly source for Linux GNUs. If you didn't listen to last week's episode, this week I'm doing a live stream after the release of this episode. This live stream is open to anyone who'd like to participate in a discussion with me about the newest items covered in today's episode. If you're interested in joining me, the stream will start at 1 p.m. Eastern today, and all you have to do is join the Tux Digital Discord server by going to tuxdigital.com slash discord. That's tuxdigital.com slash discord. Up first this week in app news, Krita 3.2 was released. And with it comes an improved smart patching tool, seven new brush presets, and a really slick improved free transform tool to allow more precise control. Also, Krita released an announcement this week thanking the community because the tax situation they had has been completely solved, and they said that the response was overwhelming. Not only was a tax issue solved, they have a surplus that they can use to now work on the application so much that they don't have to do a fundraiser later this year. So that's awesome. There was some interesting news from Cubzilla this week. Cubzilla? Cubzilla? I'm not sure. But soon it won't really matter what it is because the Cubzilla team announced that they are going to be changing the name of the project and are asking for the community to submit suggestions. They also announced that the Cubzilla project will be joining the KDE project and moving their development efforts to the infrastructure for KDE. This may beg the question, will Cubzilla now be using the KDE stack as a dependency? They have already answered that on the announcement and said that they will not be using the KDE stack. It will be staying the same as it already ha- already is. They will just be under the umbrella, so to speak, of KDE project. Have you ever wanted to use your command line to perform a Google search? Well, Googler is the tool for you. It's a powerful tool that allows you to Google search and Google site search from the command line. It was initially written to cater to headless servers without X and initially intended to integrate with a text-based browser like Lynx. But it has become a lot more robust and provides a lot more features now. You can fetch on any number of results or start anywhere. At You can say, I want to start on page 3, even. You can limit your search by any duration of time. You can define aliases to Google search any number of websites. And you can even switch domains easily so that you want to use this Google search specifically for one domain and then change it to another domain. Google is actually really pretty cool and the output you can get from the search could be really useful in a bash script, for example. The Universal Linux installer Calamari announced their plans for their future 3.2 release and that plan is to work on support for the Wayland display server. They're also going to be dropping the Boost Python implementation in future versions of the installer. By doing so, they'll make it where all supported Python modules will run in the same embedded Python interpreter, such as Python Qt. This is a major change that affects the installer's build and runtime dependencies, so it might not actually land in 3.2, but it also might be possible as well. If you've not heard of Calamari, it's an installer for KDE Neon, Gecko Linux, Sabion, Chaos, Netrunner, Chakra, and many more. So you might not have heard of it, but you've probably used it. Ardor 5.11 was released this week. If you're not familiar with it, Ardor is a digital audio workstation that allows you to compose audio from your Linux computer and other platforms as well. This release was pretty much just a bug release or a maintenance release, but I wanted to highlight it anyway because Ardor is a great program, and if you haven't heard of it, you should definitely check it out if you're interested in composing music. Chrome 60 and 61 beta was released this week. And 61 beta is probably the more interesting thing because with it came JavaScript modules and web USB support. Modules for JavaScript allow developers to declare a script's dependencies. Native support means that the browser can fetch granular dependencies in parallel, taking advantage of caching and avoiding duplications across the page. And web USB support, now being in Chrome EM, allowing web, ma- web apps to communicate with peripherals of course, provided that a user has given consent. This enables all the functionality provided by USB devices while still preserving security. While we're on the subject of Chromium, 
Canonical invites people to test out their new Chromium Snap for Chromium 60 and 61. If you'd like to, you can check out the show notes for the this episode where I'll have a link to the forum post where they talked about how to try it out and what they're wanting you to test. The Debian Project celebrated their 24th birthday this week on August 16th, so happy birthday, Debian! A lot of big news from Solus Project this week. Solus 3 was released with Budgie 10.4 and also introducing out-of-the-box snap support for Ubuntu Snappy. But first, Budgie adopted the Adapta theme and the Papyrus icon theme. They have moved the primary panel from the top of the display to the bottom of the screen. They added maximize and minimize animations for the application, so that's pretty cool. There's a new applet called Nightlight, which allows you to reduce your display's blue light level automatically based on the time of the day. They've completely overhauled the searching system for the budgie menu. They've added the ability to do vertical panels on the left and the right side of the screen. Budgie 10.4 also introduces a dock mode for the panels, utilizing a custom CSS class for customization via themes. Budgie 10.4 also moves the settings out of the Raven menu and into a dedicated application. There are so many more things to talk about for the budget release, so I'm just going to have to skip it, the rest of it, and just, if you want to look at that, go check out the notes, show notes and the video description. But before we move on to something else, I wanted to talk about the snap support in Solus. It's very, very cool that they added this, and we talked about it last week, they announced that they were going to support it, but I didn't expect it to be within a week. So that's awesome, but Solus is going to have out-of-the-box, already has out-of-the-box support for snaps, and it seems to, seems to be the first non-Ubuntu distribution for full snap confinement with AppArmor. So it's pretty much on par with features with Ubuntu, so you could transition if your workflow relies on snaps pretty easily. So yeah, Solus 3 is a very exciting release. Up next this week is LibreElect. 8.1.0 beta was released based on Cody 17.4 RC. If you have never heard of, of LibreElect, it's essentially a distro specifically for Cody. The slogan of it is just enough OS for Cody. You can use LibreElect on Raspberry Pi, normal x86 computer, an Odroid, a Qbox, and even something called a 5 Ninja Slice. First time I've heard of that one. But anyway, it's a really cool distribution that's specifically to run Cody as an entertainment center. So if you haven't che- haven't seen it before, check it out. You may find it useful. I know I have. Farron OS 2017.8 re- was released this week and upgraded the base to Linux Mint 18.2 and uses has a new and improved USB boot. Farron OS does a lot of interesting things, and I'm looking forward to keeping track of what they do. I'm not really sure how I feel about it being based on Linux Mint because, well, that's for another video. This week there was an update to the Raspbian Linux distro for the Raspberry Pi. It is now based on Debian 9 Stretch and now has Chromium 60 as a default browser. It's kind of weird to be using Chromium as the default browser for Raspberry Pi based distro, but uh, okay. Next up in distro news is the Canonical Corner, or Ubuntu news. First up, Ubuntu 17.10 allows users to amplify the sound on their laptops through media keys, so you can take it from beyond 100%. I'm not sure what the limit is, but something higher than 100%. They added a Ubuntu dock, which is part of the GNOME Shell Ubuntu node, but not enabled by default in the GNOME vanilla session. So if you were wondering if the newest Ubuntu for 17.10 would have the a GNOME vanilla option as well, such as having like Ubuntu and then Ubuntu GNOME as an another distro. They're not doing that. Instead, they're having both options in the same install, so you can choose to use the Ubuntu mode or the vanilla session. They said that they their survey results clearly demonstrated that Ubuntu users value having a dock as a part of their desktop shell. So they are making an extension installed by default that is fork a, a, a light fork of the dash to dock extension. The reason why it needed to be a fork and they couldn't just use the dash to dock extension was because they needed it to be installed by default. And in order to do that, it had to be a package and not just an extension. It had to come from the Ubuntu archive. So they had to package it first, put it in the archive, and then it could be utilized by default. 
Also, if the extension kept the same GNOME Shell extension ID that Dash to Dock has, it would be possible to bypass all of the QA and security procedures and checks that the Ubuntu team did. They decided to create a different branch of the same extension though. So this branch is actually regularly based on top of the upstream dash to dock extension and will also be kept in the same repository as the upstream code. So that kind of expresses like how much collaboration is going on between the two. 17.10 has been rebased to be on Linux kernel 4.12, but the final release that will be shipping in October will be Linux 4.13. They've all na also now upgraded to GCC 7 for the compiler and the default compiler in Ubuntu 17.10, as well as working on Qt 5.9 support, which is coming soon. The last thing about the 17.10 release is that they're going to be adding a trash can icon to the desktop. This is not really that important to talk about, but I kind of wanted to talk about it simply because there was an article by the register that talked about how they're copying something that was done 17 years ago and essentially they're trying to make it a joke that Ubuntu is taking so long to do something so simple. But they were talking about how they, they had the trash icon before, but it wasn't on the desktop. It was hidden away. You can't see me do air quotes, but hidden away on the launcher that's in your face immediately and is no way at all hidden. While this is the first time that it actually has been on the desktop as an icon, it's not the first time a trash can or a trash icon was available. For example, GNOME 2 had it in a panel, and Unity had it in the launcher. So I just wanted to point out that even the most minuscule thing to, ta to make fun of, someone's going to do it, and I figured it'd be only fair if I made fun of them for doing so. We also got some news for updates for Ubuntu 16.04. The AMD GPU-Pro 17.30, the graphics driver for Linux, brings support for 16.04.3. And Canonical has fixed regressions in the Linux 4.4 kernel packages for Ubuntu 16.04. Finally, in distro news this week, well, kind of a distro, sort of, kind of not. Anyway. Google's Android 8.0 will launch on August 21st, Monday, and the launch is scheduled to coincide with the Great American Total Eclipse. It's potentially that they're going to call it Oreo, but we don't know for sure. At some point, people were suggesting it was Octopus, but they've been doing a dessert of some kind the entire time. I really doubt it's going to be Octopus. More than likely, it's going to be Oreo. But anyway, so this is technically Linux related and technically a Linux distro, but kind of also not. So please give me your feedback whether you want to have some more Android news in the future or not. I'm okay with either way. The GNOME Project also celebrated their birthday this week. On August 15th, they celebrated their 20th birthday. So, happy birthday, GNOME! It was announced this week that GNOME 3.26 will be entering official beta and the final release has been set to September 13th. Have you ever wanted to use GNOME, but didn't like the GNOME layout at all and wanted to completely change every aspect of it? Well, you totally can do that with an application called GNOME Layout Manager. Well, it's more of a bash script than an application, but it's a script that allows you to convert your GNOME install to look similar, have a look and feel that's similar to Unity, Windows 10, or Mac OS. It's kind of like how the Ubuntu Mate interface switcher works or how the Latte Dock dynamic layouts work that we talked about last week. So if you're interested in using GNOME but you want to manipulate the way it feels and looks, you could totally check out GNOME Layout Manager. Up first in Linux gaming news, Feral Interactive is asking the gamers of the community if they want F1 SIT 2017. This might be the first time they've ever actually asked the Linux community specifically for a game rather than just an open-ended requesting. But they previously ported F1 2015 to Linux and also said that F1 2016 won't be ported as cells for the 2015 version wasn't strong enough to support it. So they're trying to see if the 2017 version has enough demand for it for them to spend the time to port it to Linux. So if you're interested in the F1 2017 version for Linux, make sure you let them know. There's a new point-and-click adventure game that was released with day one Linux support. I'm probably going to mess this name up, but Ken Follett's The Pillars of the Earth. It's a 12, It's based in 12th century England, and it looks 
pretty awesome in terms of point-and-click adventure. A game I'm excited to play called Burst is a first-person shooter that is going to early access on August 23rd. The reason I'm excited to play is because it looks kind of fun. It looks like a semi-realistic first-person shooter, but also because it's free to play. I mean, it's probably going to be like, you know, freemium where you pay for extra things or something, but that's still pretty cool, and I am definitely looking forward to it. Another first-person shooter that I'm looking forward to playing is Ballistic Overkill. They just released an update that has an experimental 64-bit Linux build, and they're adding competitive leaderboards. And who doesn't love a little bit of competition by virtually shooting people in the face? The Dawn of War series is currently on sale for up to 75% off. If the Dawn of War series is your kind of game, Warhammer 40,000 Dawn of War 2 Grandmaster Collection is on sale 75% off from $80 to $20 at the Humble Store. But you kind of need to hurry because it's only on sale for a little bit less than a day at the time of this posting. So if you hear the video or listen to the show later, sorry. Cities Skylines Concert DLC was released this week. I'm actually a fan of the main game, but I've not played any of their DLCs. But this particular one looks kind of interesting, so it's kind of cool that you can do your own event, concert event structure. I don't know, I'll, I'll take a look at it. But it looks kind of fun, and the original main game is definitely fun, so if you've not tried either one, you should definitely check it out. Next up is Out of Reach, which is a survival pirate-themed first-person shooter game. I don't know if it's a first-person shooter game, technically, but it's a first-person game for sure. And it's a survival pirate theme. Like it, You had me at pirate survival game. Now, this next one is a little weird, to say the least, because it's called Startup Company. I'm, I'm oddly intrigued by, by this because of how bizarre it is of just of a concept. It's a simulation of making your own company. Why would a business simulation sandbox game be intriguing? I mean, I don't know, but why is a Euro Truck Simulator game fun? I don't know that one either, but it is. So maybe this one might also be fun. Who knows? Finally is Spacebound, a zero-gravity puzzle platformer that looks really cool, and I totally want to play it, but unfortunately it appears that it has some reviews that say something about having compatibility issues right now on Linux. So hopefully they'll get that fixed soon. Because it does look like a pretty fun game, and I definitely want to play it. The first and only news in Linux hardware this week is the GBD Pocket is now shipping. Well, the Ubuntu version, that is. The Windows version was already shipping, but the Ubuntu version is now shipping. I still don't get how people were willing to fund this up to $3.5 million, despite only showing poorly photoshopped images of a prototype device. But, with that said... I have seen videos of it working now, and while I don't personally want to purchase it, I will admit that it does look pretty cool. I mean, not $500 cool, but still pretty cool. Thanks for watching this episode of This Week in Linux. If you like what I do here on this show, please hit that like button and be sure to subscribe for more Linux good news. If you'd like to support the channel, we have a Patreon at patreon.com slash tuxdigital. Or you can order the Linux is Everywhere t-shirt. The concept of design has Tux blended into the background to convey the message. Even if you aren't aware that Linux is there, it probably is. The shirt is available from sh for shipping from North America and from Europe. Thanks for watching. I'm Michael Tunnell with Tux Digital. And as always, keep using, learning, and enjoying Linux.